Prairie Melody Premium Black Oil Sunflower Bird Seed. Locally grown, supporting farms in transition to organic production. More information at prairiemelodybirdseed.com. Prairie Melody, it's all about the birds and the bees. Well, hello there, and happy spring to all of you, and thanks for watching to watching another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shade Spain. We've got three fantastic panelists here tonight to answer all of your questions, and they've got some great show and tells to bring with them. So let's just jump in and have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So we'll start with you, Chuck. Hi, I'm Chuck Voigt. I'm a retired uh, vegetable and herb specialist from the Department of Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. And I can answer questions in that area, probably a little bit about uh, fruit and you know, some other things, but we've got, got some probably better uh, insect and, and uh, um, general horticulture kinds of people. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get it. You'll do what you can. You'll do what you, you can. You betcha. <laughs> All right, Kent. Hi, I'm Kent Miles. I'm the owner of Illinois Willows. <coughs> uh, we're located in Western Champaign County. And we're a specialty cut flower grower. We have product 12 months of the year, and I can answer questions on perennials, cut flowers, uh, woody ornamentals. So that's about where I'm at. Okay, last but not least. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, and I do bugs. If it's crawls, I can answer it. Okay. Hmm. Short and sweet. So we are live tonight. Just wanted to remind you, and we would love to have your calls. So please call us. The phone number is 217-333-3495. Call and give these guys a run for their money in their area of expertise. Okay, so we've got some show and tells. Chuck, we'll start with you. What'd you bring us? Well, I was shopping this week. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I found some giant Brussels sprouts the likes of which I had never seen. I went back to get them for the show, couldn't find them. Oh. So I went into the salad section because uh, we've got some nice baby lettuce and spinach here mixed together and some, some beautiful red radishes. And those are all things that we're very soon going to be able to plant outside here in, in mid-America, you know, depending on where you are and, and where we are with rain and snow and moisture and flooding and whatever. Time-wise, we're, we're getting into that, that, that general uh, uh, vicinity. The one thing, the reason I started out with Brussels sprouts is I want to reiterate that now is not the time to start Brussels sprouts. Okay. Brussels sprout seeds should be started in June and transplanted in July so that they mature into the fall. Otherwise, that bitter nastiness, they, they, first of all, they don't make tight little heads. And then they also, the, the bitterness in them just goes through the roof. So unless you're just super into bitter, uh, Interesting. Start them later. Uh, don't be fooled into buying them. It, the only problem is it's a little hard to find them. Mm -hmm. Find somebody who's willing to start them in, in June and sell them to you in July. But other than that, if you're doing your own, definitely do it that way. I, I'm not a fan of them. <clears throat> so do you want them, when you said that they were really big, you know, some vegetables, if they get too big, they don't taste well. So, so what are you looking for in a sprout? In a, you want them to be tight. Okay. Uh, the ones that, that that try to make sprouts in July and August, they'll be kind of fluffy, mm -hmm. kind of like a cabbage before it really gets yeah. gets tight. Um, you want to be really tight. Um, if you're growing them in your garden, you want to be harvesting them after a frosty night, or, or even better, after like a night with sleet and where it's been really cold, because they they're kind of building up the sugars in them at that point, and and the, whatever the bitter principle is either doesn't, doesn't develop or starts to dissipate in the cold weather. So like going out on a, on a November day and, and kind of cracking the ice off of, off of your Brussels sprouts, <laughs> that would be the ideal time to do it because uh, they're just so much sweeter and, and less bitter. So I'm a, I can eat Brussels sprouts, but I don't travel long distances to do it. A lot of other people love them. Certainly Food Network is, mm -hmm. it's, have, has just gone crazy about them. So. Interesting. Maybe I just didn't prepare them well. Maybe I'll have to try some different Try recipes. bacon. <laughs> of course. <laughs> bacon literally fixes everything. <laughs> All right, Kent, what did you bring? <laughs> wow, bacon. Okay. <laughs> bacon wrapped uh, tulips. <laughs> so I brought in some of our tulips that we're harvesting at the present time. Uh, we've been um, harvesting tulips for a little over a month now. Uh, this year we're doing around 8,000 wow. stems. Uh, we do them in about six colors. Um, most of our popular ones are the yellows, pinks, and the purples. Mm -hmm. uh, we do <coughs> mix the selection a little bit each year, just to change it up a little bit, as far as heavier on some colors than others. 
um, we bunch them in a 10 stem bunch and generally the um, consumer get at least get a, a week out of them. Mm -hmm. they, it's, it's one of those flowers that will keep on growing mm -hmm. once you cut it and put it in a vase of water. Uh, and then also you need to probably move your vase around because they're going to bend towards the light, the natural sunlight, or if you have like a, uh, a lamp on, they'll bend to that. So it's getting to be about that time uh, for the homeowners. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to start to see some starting to pop up. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go ahead and you want to cut them generally when they're just starting to show color in the heads you get the longest face life out of them at that time. That's just what I was going to yeah. ask if you if that's w when it's ideal yeah, to cut it them. it is. You don't want to really cut them when they're already starting to open up. Gotcha. And they will kind of close up at night and then open up again mm -hmm. during the day. So um, Now, just for outside, if, mm -hmm. if people start to see these peaking up, is there anything that you need to be doing right now in your beds to... Just a little maintenance, just a little cleaning up. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically, if you've got debris that came in or blew in, mm -hmm. you know, over the last winter, uh, just go ahead and tidy some of that stuff up. Uh, but really, tulips can take the snow on them. They can go down to the colder temperatures. So. Gotcha. And we'll talk a little bit more about some other flowers and plants that can take those cooler temps, too, a little bit later. Okay. What did you bring us, bug guy? <laughs> I brought in houseplant <laughs> bugs. <laughs> and uh, and a couple of the most common ones are, uh, are mealybug, which will... The little uh, uh, white pieces of fluff get up to about an eighth of an inch long and they feed by sucking sap out of the leaves and the other one is right here. Uh, this uh, scale and the most common one is the one that's at my fingers near which is brown soft scale. Uh, here's some more of them here on a palm and, uh, and they will start out smaller and more flattened uh, like here on this particular plant. And so the uh, and so they suck out the, the sap, and they take out more sap than they can really uh, really handle, and so on. And so uh, a lot of the excess sap, or or actually uh, what they pulled the nitrogen out of, will drip down, and it will be a concentrated sap or a light syrupy material we call honeydew. And when an entomologist talks about honeydew, that's not really something that's a melon. So. <laughs> So uh, it's kind of come out of the far <laughs> end of a bug uh, that's a sucking insect. And this provides uh, a lot of carbohydrate, uh, a, uh, a sugary type material, which you end up getting what's called sooty mold. It's a black mold that will, that will live on the sugars associated with honeydew. And this time of year when we get towards the end of winter and you've had the, had the house plants inside all winter, a few little insects were on it when it came in have kind of built up and any predators or parasites have died off because they couldn't find enough bugs to eat but there were a few left and they built up and many times you need to get control on these with uh, insecticidal soap or some other type of, of uh, control agent. Uh, this will provide, uh, provide good control of them or another thing is if they're not too bad you just kind of wait until you get into spring and if you move your house plants out into a shady area, maybe on the east or north side, they don't get too much sun. Uh, and uh, there'll be, little, there'll be uh, lady beetles and, and little tiny parasitic wasps and other things that will eat these things up and knock them way back down to where in the fall you bring the plants back in, you won't be able to see anything on there. But after a few months, they'll start to build up enough, you'll see them. And so it can kind of work that way. I had a weeping fig for for probably a decade or more that uh, put it outside and and it would it would get cleaned up and then it would about this time of year start to build up a little bit and sometimes I'd spray it but most of the time I didn't I just kind of figure and another four five six weeks to go outside <laughs> and I'll take care of it so uh, you can be really heavy on it or you can be lazy fair I like to go lazy fair same like I was telling you I, every <laughs> once in a while I'll find one and just pick it off and meh. and that worked great yeah works for me okay before we come back around to round two I kind of hinted at uh, some of those plants and flowers that can take the colder temps earlier this week uh, myself and DJ our director extraordinaire visited <laughs> Danville Gardens in Danville and we talked about just that take a look okay 
so it is officially spring and we are out and about and we are at Danville Gardens with co-owner Lisa Campbell. And so if you're like me and waiting till Mother's Day weekend is the hardest thing ever, there are a few things that you can get out and put in the ground early, right? Yes. And so what are we talking about? Well, one of the first things that can go out are pansies. We love pansies. They're available in so many beautiful colors. We have them in mixes and colors that are just monocolor, just all orange or all purple. Um, pansies and violas both can go out now anytime. Even if it gets cold, everybody oh, always thinks that they are going to get hurt. <laughs> they can take it down easily below 20 no oh, problem wow. okay. we are growing them in the greenhouse so they are warm but we keep it a little cooler in here mm -hmm. so they are acclimated to the outside if you put them out you don't have to worry about them getting frosted and having a problem um, so I brought a pot here to show they can go in a pot very easy mm -hmm. um, you can put them out on the front porch and have something if you're really paranoid and you don't want to trust me that they can go below 20 then bring the pot inside just make sure whatever you're planting in has a good drain hole okay. so I want to make sure you guys see has a nice hole in the bottom mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems with pansies is that they'll get root rot so if they're kept too wet okay. then you'll see them what happens with root rot is they kind of wilt down and they look like they're wilting and they need a drink and a lot of times you'll water so that again triggers you to get the water and, and then you just you know accelerated the disease gotcha. so I mean, you want to be very careful that anything you're planting we always recommend you have a drain hole just because it's safer once they're too wet it's hard to dry them out gotcha. if they're too dry you can always add more water but you can't take the water away gotcha okay so very important so for folks who are just itching to get out there in the dirt you can always go with pansies you said violas as well pansies and violas there are other a few really nice items that can go out. We do a lot of super tunias. Mm -hmm. They are usually grown outside in our outside growing area. So we've had them down as cold as 27, ice on the leaves and <laughs> frozen soil, um, but they can go out cold too. So okay. there's some really nice items that can take it very cold. So you're not just limited to pansies, but it is much better than it used to be 30 years ago when you were told never to plant until yes. after Mother's Day. Yes. Um, things have been bred to be cold tolerant and do much better and be healthier and happier when it's cooler. Ah, we are so close, so close. Thanks so much to Lisa and Nathan for letting us come in and take a look uh, and talk with them. And we'll have more uh, segments from them as we move throughout the spring. So um, what other things, Kent, uh, we talked about the tulips, but mm. what other things are cold hardy that uh, hyacinths. Okay. Uh, daffodils are starting to come up. Mm -hmm. I've so seen those here jonquils, that kind of all the same there. Um, but any of those um, early bulbs, muscari mm -hmm. is another one that we're starting to see it pop up a little bit. Awesome. It's okay. kind of a, a benefit of the cold we've had this winter mm -hmm. is that they didn't get a head start because sometimes if we have one of those warm Februarys, they're up and oh, growing, yeah. and, you're, and you've got daffodils trying to open <laughs> up, and then. Mm -hmm. Predictably, it goes down to 10 or 15 degrees, mm -hmm. and what happens is they freeze right down next to the ground, so they flop. Gotcha. And it's just, it's just pathetic because you wait all year for that display, that, yeah. and it lasts short enough time as it is. So I'm, I'm almost glad that, we, that yeah. we stayed cold longer. Maybe we'll get a nice display this year. I yeah. hope so. Okay. All right. So, um, Chuck, you've got another show? <coughs> I do. Uh, oh, hang on just one second. I'm, right. I'm told we're going to take a call and then we're going to come back to you. Well, <laughs> All right, we're going to go to line two, Paula and Normal. Uh, she has a question about mildew. Paula, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. I have raised beds, and last year the bed that had peas in it got mildew, and I had to pull everything. I want to know if that will come back this year and if it might spread to the other beds. you think hmm. <laughs> you've stumped them I think judging by the furrowed brows where's Jim Schuster when we need it <laughs> well a lot of it's going to be it depend on what kind of mildew you have if it's uh, if it's downy mildew that's going to perhaps be more of a problem from year to year uh, but uh, but there also is mildew that'll just be on the surface of the leaf such as what you typically have associated with lilacs uh, later in the season 
and uh, and that's a surface type of, of fungus just growing on the on the surface of the leaf and it just needs the right uh, conditions and in fact uh, the main thing associated with any type of fungal disease is going to be the right conditions and in general most fungi need cool damp conditions and so as long as you can many times space out the plants to where you or, or prune the plants where you get good air movement in through the plants plants that have a tendency to get various types of, of mildew problems or fungal problems such as roses uh, you always or other fungal problems you always want to put those out where it gets plenty of of wind and breezes through it and spaced out so so things don't air doesn't stagnate associated with it so uh, weather conditions have an awful lot on whether more probably on whether you're going to have a fungus problem a mildew problem the next year than than the uh, disease organism overwintering because you can kind of assume it's always going to be around it's just needs the right conditions. Gotcha. Okay. It, it is good oh, that they sorry. took that they pulled them out and got rid of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Is that if you know it, it, it may be around all over, but if it's around right there, that's not really a good thing. Really heavily concentrated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to go to um, Alan in Decatur <coughs> with a question about cutting flowers. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah. <coughs> when you cut your flowers and you bring them in and put them in water there, what can you put in your water there to make them last a little longer? Um you can get uh, either through a flower shop or you can get uh, through uh, other companies uh, what's called flower food and it's just a packet of a powder it has a fungicide a bacterial site in it and basically some sugars um, that will prolong the vase life of the flowers uh, you want to recut them before you put them in the water uh, generally cool water rather than warm and generally changing the water about every two to three days and removing any foliage that's going to be down in the water. Okay, we're going to go to Janet in Springfield with a question about cutting roses. Janet, go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my call. I was uh, curious, when is the best time to trim uh, knockout roses? Is it in the fall or the spring? I would say in the spring. spring. Uh, because you never are 100% sure how, how, how well they're going to overwinter. And if you cut them in the fall, any winter kill is going to be from where you cut them downward. Further, further downward. Mm -hmm. Where if you just leave everything through the winter, it, when the buds start to break, you can see what's alive. And then you can cut out anything that's clearly dead and then start choosing buds so that, you know, so that they grow outward and, and, and have a nice pleasing mm -hmm. plant uh, thing. But I would... I would do it in the spring after the buds start to break. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to go to, let's see, David in Springfield with a question about bagworms. Go ahead, David. Yes, I want to know when you should start spraying for bagworms and uh, what you should use. Uh, typically, you don't need to spray for bagworms until they're out. And they're not going to hatch until about the middle part of June in central Illinois. A couple, uh, so that latitude. Uh, a couple weeks earlier in the, in the southern end of, of Illinois and across the Midwest, and a couple weeks later uh, at the at the northern part <coughs> of Illinois and and farther east and west, and so uh, and then and then really they need to kind of you let them go for a couple weeks before you would actually treat because they'll blow around from place to place and if you only want to treat once, you wait until a couple weeks after that. So typically, say in the central part. Of, of the Midwest, you're looking at around the 4th of July is a good time to kind of figure on that. Bacillus syringiensis, so does BT or BTK, Bacillus syringiensis, Kirstaki, Dipel, Thuricide, and many other brand names are very effective on that. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a bacterial toxin, doesn't do anything to people or pets, unless you're keeping pet caterpillars. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so that'll work well at this time of year, and in fact up until, the, until June, you can go out there and pick those bags off. Every other one will be a female, have two to three hundred eggs inside her, mm -hmm. and you throw those in a in a plastic bag, put it in the trash, and let it get dumped in your local landfill. So uh, don't drop them under the trees; they will hatch down there and crawl up the trees and feed on it. So this time of year in the spring, you can uh, get a good day, go bagworm picking. Oh, <laughs> all right. We're going to go to Kay in Decatur with a question about moths. Kay, go ahead. Hi. I have got uh, patio blocks in my backyard, and I have tried to control over the years with um, uh, spraying and everything, but it is the kind of moss that is uh, 
kind of puffy looking, which people like to have on their clay pots, but I don't want it in my yard, so I don't know what the problem is. How can I get rid of it? I don't understand which moth you're talking about. There's only, uh, you know, two or three thousand in the state of Illinois, different kinds of moths, so I would need to know a little bit more. Uh, you might want to, if you get, if you have some photos, uh, you can send those uh, into our, from our website, uh, Mid-American Gardener, uh, or you can go to your local extension office and they will help you identify what the moth is. And from that, you can start <coughs> to figure out what to do about it. But I don't, uh, I can't figure out what moth you're talking about from your description. Okay, Richard with a question about bed bugs. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, huh. Yes, uh, this has nothing to do with garden insects, but a lady wanted me to call. She was embarrassed to call. Uh, she, they were having problems with bed bugs, and I was wondering if there's any kind of a uh, uh, spray of some sort that she could use to rid these or not. Controlling bed bugs is, a, is, a, is an involved pest management program. You're right, it's outside the scope of this program. You just need to contact your local extension office and they will help you on that. We really don't talk about household insects on a gardening show. Okay, we're going to Ray and Brand Tool with a question about Japanese beetles. Ray, go ahead. Hi, how do you control Japanese beetles on raspberry bushes? Uh, that's a real problem because any type of a spray you're going to use on them has, uh, you're going to end up losing ripening raspberries in the process. So uh, even uh, something like Carbaryl Soda 7, uh, that has only a one day waiting period, you're still looking at, at, uh, at loss of some fruit. Uh, but uh, generally uh, what you can do is, uh, is, is many times control them on, on the foliage of, of other plants around the area. And really, in my opinion, some of the things that are really bothered a lot when they're fruiting, uh, you use screens, uh, canopies over the top of a bushes such as blueberries, raspberries, grapes, these sorts of things. Uh, they're feeding at the same time and you don't want to be spraying on those. But if you do, you want to make sure you're following harvest restrictions on how many days you have to wait before you can harvest a plant crop. All right, Phyllis in Champaign has a question about holly berries. Go ahead, Phyllis. Hi, um, excuse me. I planted some hollyberry bushes last summer and I wanted to know if you could give me any advice on the pros and cons of what I should and shouldn't do to keep them healthy and growing. Well, first off, you have to have very acid soil, and that's a problem in most areas of the Midwest is that we do not have acid enough soil for hollies to do real well, and so you're kind of replacing the soil do you know what the pH is? Is it around around six or six five or? I would think it would be under six would okay. be ideal. And so many times you're looking at a raised bed. They do need very good drainage, uh, and uh, and you're kind of uh, replacing the soil with something that that has a lot of peat moss in it, or uh, or addition of sulfur or various other acidifying agents to get that pH down to have really healthy holly bushes. Otherwise, you have ones that are kind of hanging on. Mm -hmm. They don't really grow real well most of the time. And of course, there's always somebody that can say, well, mine do well and I didn't do any of this. But they probably just got lucky enough to have, or unlucky enough to have acidic soil, because that mm -hmm. acidic soil doesn't grow m much other things besides right. blueberries and, <laughs> yeah. and, some, uh, and some hydrangeas and things like this. So Yeah, yeah. you can probably talk about it too. The, the native holly really gets killed here in the winter if it's, if it's windy and sunny and, yeah, and frozen. Yeah, it does. Um, some of the some of the other types hold but up like a little the, better. Like the deciduous, usually has any problems with the deciduous hollies. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. And there there are some protective sprays you can use <coughs> to help them not winter kill so much mm -hmm. from wind burn, but it's still not so much. All right, Bridget in Springfield with a question about crab apple trees. Go ahead, Bridget. I was wondering, is it safe to go ahead and trim a crab apple tree in springtime, or sh or should I have done that in fall? I think it's fine. You could probably do it now. I you, wouldn't think you, there'd you, be. You know, you will want to be a little careful with how much you take off mm -hmm. because all their flower buds are going to be there. And if you get if you get crazy and especially shortening branches, you could you could damage the floral display. But in terms of like cleaning out water sprouts and suckers and mm -hmm. and opening the plant up so that it gets good air circulation, 
I think this is a is a good time yeah, to be doing just it. Just some selective pruning. Just yeah. don't go. Selective pruning. Yeah. I like yeah. it. All right, Susan in Effingham with a question about hydrangeas. Go ahead, Susan. Yes, um, thank you for taking my call. I have about three hydrangeas on the east side of the house, and they're about six feet tall. They're the ones that get the white cone flowers on them. And I'd like to know when you cut those back. So if it's a conical cone-shaped blossom, uh, we do that uh, generally about the end of March. So right on schedule. next couple of weeks, you want to trim those back. Okay. Because they'll be blooming on this year's new growth. Okay. All right, so we've got about a minute left, and I want to get to your squash <laughs> because you were going for it, and I, then we had this rapid I wanna, fire. I want to <laughs> brag about my butternut squash because here we are. It's officially spring, and I still have 10 of these beauties uh, just, just waiting. You know, as, as anything shows up on them, we've been, we've been eating them. Uh, but butternut squash is probably uh, the easiest to grow in terms of the bugs don't like it as well as a lot of other kinds. Um, it seems to do really well. Mine just languished because it was so dry where I was growing them. And, and then we got late rain, and they put on uh, probably another twice as many as they had on them. Uh, some of them didn't get overly ripe, and those are the ones I think we've been eating as, as time has gone along. But butternut squash, uh, much easier. Uh, you know, just for eating, I would prefer a, a buttercup, but these are much easier. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>